Welcome to the Analog Space Mission course part number seven. Today I'll be talking about life support systems. Uh, today's content is going to be the definition of life support systems as we know them for space related applications. Uh, what we kind of find in usual space missions, so what kind of life support system you should expect to see on the International Space Station, for example, the complexity that is associated with them, and comparing real analog space mission and space missions uh, life support systems. So what do we find in analog space missions and why? And then we'll be looking into a few different cases of analog space mission life support systems and talk uh, very shortly, briefly, about the future of life support systems applications in analog space missions. So the definition, one of the definitions, if we take, for example, NASA's life support system, uh, the activities uh, develop the capabilities to sustain humans who are living and working in space, away from Earth's protective atmosphere and resources like water, air and food. Uh, it includes monitoring, atmospheric pressure, oxygen levels, waste management, water supply, as well as fire detection and suppression. So you see, it's, it's quite a vast thing. It doesn't necessarily include, for example, energy, so electricity, but it could be related because you could potentially um, create energy from, for example, human waste. Um, and you need to use energy, for example, to use hydrolysis to extract water uh, from, for example, atmospheric breathing. OK, um, so these are not necessarily completely separate, but usually when we think about life support system, obviously we're talking really from a human standpoint. We can generate energy, but for example, it's difficult <laughs> for us, we can't generate oxygen, right? We rely on different uh, supports, and these are the life support systems. Robots don't need oxygen, for example, most of them. Um, so they don't need those life support systems the same way humans do. So the usual life support systems you might find, this is a very short illustration of the life support system schematic of NASA. Uh, you can see the relations between uh, air, water, humidity control, temperature control and human waste. Uh, how you can correlate some of them, recycle some of these uh, together. Uh, you can, for example, separate uh, solid waste with liquid waste, human waste still. And you can recycle urine uh, and then you can use it and then perform hydrolysis and extract oxygen from it. Um, you could also extract uh, hydrogen that you then use in processes we're going to talk right after. And you could also create methane and you could technically burn it and, you know, create energy. So a lot of these, um, I say, waste and products actually correlated. Obviously, humidity also changes with breathing, okay? So you have lots of different monitoring systems that are usually closely linked. And it's even more important thinking that obviously you are trying to be as autonomous as possible. At the moment with the International Space Station, we're not that far, okay? So if you're missing something, you could potentially wait a few days, a few weeks until there's a launch, and then you could be sending extra water, uh, extra plants, um, oxygen even, you know, compressed air. These are the kind of things that you could send. However, if you're on the moon or you're on Mars, the delay will be much longer because you need to be in a favorable orbit. And then, for example, the travel to Mars, Mars is half a year to even more. So it's much more complicated. So there's an increased interest in being as autonomous as possible. And something that's actually quite interesting is being autonomous is also interesting for us on Earth. Um, as we see with, for example, earthquakes and floods, if we were to have habitats that could survive it, but get disconnected from the grid, from you know the city, or you know that you don't have energy anymore, you don't have water anymore, if you had an autonomous recycling system of, for example, your liquid waste, then you wouldn't be running out of water that quickly. Um, so it could be something that is very profitable for, for people. Also in the desertic island, we'll be talking about um, some very interesting initiative there at the end of this uh, course. Uh, but there's a lot of interest also for Earth application to have this autonomous system. So it's something that's been actually um, looked at for over, I don't know, 60, 70 years. It's been really something that's been researched for quite a long time. So one of the main equations, uh, you might not be chemist, but you probably have 
a very, very, very small base of chemistry, so it shouldn't be too complicated. Uh, but you got on the top uh, the two main reactions that are used uh, basically for the uh, Sabatier reaction, which is used on the International Space Station. Basically, you've got water can be split into oxygen and hydrogen by electrolysis. Once you have a um, astronaut that's going to breathe in this oxygen, it's going to convert to, into di uh, carbon dioxide. And there's going to be also hydrogen is going to be expelled. And this hydrogen used to be removed. Now, actually, what we can do is take this hydrogen that we obtain firstly by electrolysis from water. We add it to it and then we create methane, CH4, and oxygen. And then this oxygen is um, briefed in again by astronauts and you can expel the CH4, which is why it's in red. However, we could make it a bit better. Uh, instead of discarding the methane, uh, if you were to perform pyrolysis at 1200 degrees Celsius, you could produce more dehydrogen, which you could then add again to the equation that we saw before, and then you could produce even more oxygen. So instead of extracting the hydrogen from the water, you would extract it from CH4, and it means you would need as much water. So it's something that would be quite interesting for longer duration missions. And then to close the loop, a little bit more, you could also uh, use the Hoche equation. At the moment, it's not really stable around temperatures of 600 degrees Celsius. It's still in development. It's not applicable right now, but it is uh, quite focused at the moment. And basically, the only waste that you would have would be carbon. Um, so you would be able to extract water from this, and then you could also try to reverse it. So quite an interesting equation to look at. So very simple chemistry. You don't need to know it per se by heart. It's just to make you understand uh, that it's actually quite simple the way uh, the, the chemistry behind it it's more that you need some energy or you need some other resources and it would be actually more profitable if we could actually not depend so much on those resources by using for example the Bosch reaction or reusing um, CH4 for the production of oxygen and water for example so uh, real versus analog space missions from my previous presentation, you must have guessed, uh, analog space mission, I usually, how you say, not necessarily have a lot of funds. Uh, the habitats are also very, very diverse and building those habitats and bringing them is very complex, okay? In addition to little funding and diversity in habitats and complexity, there's also the human factor. When you have, for example, a controlled atmosphere, it usually means you have a pressurized system. And a pressurized system, while necessary in space, is not on Earth. And it's very, very complex. So you would like to put it only if you really need to, like if you don't have a choice. But if you can perform an analog space mission without having to pressurize the habitat, you actually save a lot of money that you wouldn't need to, that you could, for example, spend on the experiments or on you know, training for the analog astronauts or the habitat or whatever it is. But you could actually invest some money in, in different things. You could, however, say that, yes, it lowers the fidelity of the analog mission, but it increases the safety of the astronauts, for example, if you were, for example, to have a different in pressure between the, the habitat and outside if there was to be a decompression problem. Normally the pressure difference shouldn't be that great, but that could still happen and that could be dangerous and you don't want your analog astronauts to be in danger. There is uh, at least two habitats uh, underwater. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of them later. And there, of course, then you have a pressurized habitat. Uh, but then it's, it's obviously more dangerous and it's more expensive to run, but it's not by far the majority of analog habitats. All habitats that are yeah, almost civilian-led uh, do not have pressurization system if they are on Earth because it's, it's just too complex. But there are talks about creating those, those modules. So there's this health safety hazard, the cost, there's the fact also you need a backup system. So not only do you need to first have all your monitoring system and you know pressurizing system, for example, you also need a backup in case it fails and that costs even more money, even more safety, right? So it's, it's quite complicated because as soon as you put people into danger, then, you know, there's a problem in, in having to have a redundancy in case of failure. The monitoring systems that exist in our space mission are actually fairly cheap and easy to have. Um, for one of my missions, for example, we went to Granite Tunnel and granite uh, is slightly radioactive, like you can't emit xenon. 
Uh, so you have to monitor that just in case the radiation level goes a bit high up. Normally it doesn't, it was well ventilated, uh, so we didn't have the problem, but we still needed to monitor it. We also needed to monitor CO2, and it's actually quite interesting because you could see when some of us were working out, the CO2 levels would go up. Um, and on the first day, just before we started the mission, we had about a dozen journalists coming to visit and see the base, and you could see how the CO2 levels were spiking up. Well, these are okay in a habitat that is well ventilated or has a connection to outdoors, for example. Not usually the case, but you never know. Um, in a very small habitat, it's problematic. Uh, the ISS typically has often t problems with the CO2 scrubber. And when you have high level of CO2, while it can become poisonous at certain levels, before that you actually get kind of angry, irritated. And obviously you do not want a crew that is angry or irritated in a very, very small environment is extremely dangerous, like the International Space Station. So it is definitely a problem, and it's the kind of thing that is very, very easy to monitor. It can be just a small like tube like this, uh, small disk, and just sends values directly to Mission Control Center and to the astronauts, and you can monitor this. And what can you do? Well, you can try to change the ventilation, check the CO2 scrubber if you do have one, or simply tell astronauts, okay, we delay when we have the sports session or just try to calm down a bit and not do uh, very, very straining activities, okay? And try to understand why those CO2 spikes so high. Uh, is there another way that we can control them? But it, it's quite easy. Temperature, obviously, everybody has a thermometer at home, uh, pressure. So the, the monitoring itself is very easy, it's quite cheap, and the majority of analog space missions do it. However, what did they do about it? That's something different. Uh, recently, I was even I even learned that one of the habitats uh, was supposed to be kept at 21 degrees, which is quite warm, and the crew actually did not like cold weather, and they chose 26 degrees, and so the energy bill would be quite high. Um, so sometimes the crew will modify uh, components, but that's actually a luxury and not by far the norm. Um, so yeah, quite interesting to see the differences between analog missions and, and space mission, which is really mostly cost and safety related. Now one example of uh, um, how you say life support system for a crew, uh, so really an analog mission that was fo focused on this, which is actually quite rare, was the BIOS BIOS free, BIOS free, you can pronounce it. It was built in Russia uh, between, I think it was 1968 to 1972, a few years of constru uh, construction. And it was in use between 1972 to 1984. Uh, it could host a crew from one to three people, and the longest mission was about 180 days, about 10 different missions in total. Uh, it was about 310 cubic meters, uh, and it was built of four compartments. It was on the ground, so there was no real light. It was all artificial lighting that could be actually modified. And it could be modified so that three of those compartments were actually for plant growth and algae. Um, it could be modified so that you could see the different uh, implications of you know, humidity, temperature, and light on the plant growth. And 25% of the air was filtered by those plant and algae. Uh, it was then stopped, but it was it's quite interesting to see already back back then there was this quite huge initiative into looking into being independent because if we want to have long duration space exploration, so not long uh, space stays like we have an international space station, as I mentioned before, where we can cargo in and back. Uh, oxygen or food or water but if you want to be really fully autonomous you need to research these things and this is something that we've known for a long time um, so using plants is the most evident way of um, bringing this autonomy together and algae actually even on earth in general are the ones who release the most oxygen so it's actually a good idea to um, to use them the word that is used for those uh, compartments that are really allocated for the control and monitoring of plants are called phytotrons. So it's called experimental systems where life, temperature, humidity and atmosphere can be controlled. So if you've ever seen that word, you didn't know what it was, now you know. <laughs> uh, ooh, should I remove my face from this? So um, the Hestia facility, um, so it's built by NASA. It's actually quite interesting. Um, so let me zoom in too. Um, so you can see here all the systems. If some of you have a degree in electrical engineering, you probably know what some of these 
um, symbols mean, but in general it should be, how you say, design it enough, like uh, explain enough that you should understand. So on the top, you can see, so this is the, the Hester base that has several floors, okay? And you can see on the top, you've got the fire safety system, so fire suppression system, where it would pour out basically water if needed. And you can see there's filtration systems, uh, there's an electrolyzer, and you can see the air locks on the left side of the, of the image. And you can see that some of the systems are in the central tube of the Hester base and some of them are on the exter external side of the system. Uh, you can look at where the toilets, where the urine is separated from the solid waste, uh, where the air is purified, uh, where the salty reaction is being used and where the oxygen is being generated. Uh, and it's, it's a very beautiful example of a life support system that is extremely I say, advanced for an analog space mission. Um, so if you're ever interested in it, there's links for the Hester base, you can actually visit it uh, at the end of these slides. Uh, have a look into it, it's a very, very interesting case. Then you can see the application of Hestia onto Mars, so how they would split into several different buildings, and one would be obviously focused on, for example, astronauts and the spacesuits, the other would be focused on the habitat, and the other would be focused more on rovers. Uh, and you would see also how you have also cooling systems, and how you can use actually oxygen and CH4 for solid oxide fuel cells. Solid oxide fuel cells basically uses these products uh, to produce energy, and they, they basically kind of batteries uh, that you can use for, for rovers and also for spacesuits, and they're quite interesting. Um, so it's a really nice way to start closing the loop into thinking more about uh, long duration and, you know, remote space exploration. Now, a case that I find very interesting of analog space missions, so there's uh, two uh, space missions that are underwater, there's the NEMO one and there's the Hydronaut, and the Hydronaut one is a civilian uh, analog space mission that is in Czech Republic, and it's an underwater facility habitat that can hold up to three people in, in the base. Um, normally two people is more comfortable for a longer duration, like for 30 days. Uh, next year there's going to be the biggest analog space missions and it's going to be 30 days and plus, so there they're going to put only two people. But what's quite interesting is compared to all the analog space missions that take place on Earth, like on the ground, this one is under the water, which means that there it has to be really functioning and you need to have a pressurized systems and you need to control the atmosphere correctly. Um, because if there's a leak, if there's a problem with the air, the astronauts cannot escape like this, okay? Uh, it's 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 not you can't open the airlock and you're out right even in the Arctic or in the desert if if you have a problem and you need to escape your habitat technically you can uh, you could open the door and then there's oxygen breathable oxygen might be very warm might be very cold you might die in a few minutes but you're not going to die normally from oxygen deprivation and from drowning okay you're going to die because of exposure Whereas when you are underwater, if you need to escape, then you have a bigger problem. Obviously, all people using this habitat underwater are trained scuba divers, but you still have this problem, okay? So it makes it one of the most, I would say, I would say stressful uh, space mission in the regard that there is a real safety component. There's a real safety issue in this. You cannot... Uh, fail. If you fail, you're dead. Okay, and then they have to really monitor the temperature, the humidity, the CO2, the crew. It's a very small habitat. I think it's uh, 10 square meters uh, or 12 square meters. So very, very small. Okay, and then you need obviously to be able to exert the, the CO2 and monitor how oxygen that is delivered into it, and you can use sabotage methods to to, to uh, convert the, um, the CO2 into oxygen again using hydrolysis. So it's quite quite interesting uh, to see this, this initiative. In the next two years, it will be on the ground, uh, so it'll be visited, and they will probably modify some of the life support system in there too. Uh, there's not space too much for plants. Uh, so to produce oxygen with plants, you actually need quite a large surface. As you saw before in the BIOS 3, um, initiative, I mean, three of the four compartments almost were for plants, right? 
and still they only produced 25% of the oxygen that was needed for the crew, one to three people, okay? So in an environment that is as small as the hydronauts wouldn't be able to produce its own oxygen with algae. However, maybe we could have underground farming or, you know, a separate compartment we could then create the oxygen that would be needed. And speaking of which, there's actually two initiatives that I found very interesting that are in progress. So it's the future initiatives for life support systems and our space missions. So the Jordan Space Research Initiative, which is developing agriculture and water management system for further use in analog space mission in desertic countries. So it's uh, obviously Jordanian and they have large issues with water management systems, agriculture and, you know, to see it in general. So by developing those waste management system, life support systems for space, they could then apply it for Earth. Um, so they're going to, use, well, they already started, but they're going to create a, a little space mission there where they're going to really focus on those water management system and closed looped environments. The other one, which is extremely comprehensive, will normally start building in 2025, is the Biodiceus um, mission. There will be an underwater base, again, so hopefully the third one, this one, uh, which is an mostly autonomous base, which will be under the Arctic. It might be first in Greenland, then it might be moved somewhere else in the Arctic. It should be at a depth of between 6 to 10 meters. And the goal is for it to be as autonomous as possible. And the interesting thing is that it wants to create most of the oxygen via algae and plants, again, like uh, the BIOS-3 experiment. They will have also an airlock so people can go diving right away so that you need the compression or compression tank in it. So it already shows that not only do you need the um, whole pressurization systems and escape system that, for example, the hydronaut and Nemo have, but you also need this airlock where you can go, you know, out and, and diving. And that's also very, very interesting um, to see if it's going to work. It's quite unlikely that it would be fully autonomous, at least from an um, air standpoint. But it's a very interesting project and it will hopefully be used for training in analog space missions. Here you have a last little photo that was uh, me recycling NASA slides <laughs> for your course. Uh, but you can see basically like the schematic of uh, life support systems. Um, just a little mention in analog space mission, we, we don't have huge fire emergency systems. We have standard fire emergency systems. Uh, because you don't normally have an airlock. As mentioned, normally you can just open the door. Obviously, for missions like Hydronaut, Nemo, and Biodiceus, this is going to be different because you are underwater, you have to be much more careful. Voila, so I hope you enjoyed this class. It's very, very short. Obviously, life support systems have both the problem that they can be extremely complex, so I'm not going in depth because obviously it involves quite a lot of uh, chemistry and it involves lots of different systems that can be very different depending on the situation. However, if you're interested, do check out the Hestia base because it's very interesting to see all the systems that are used together and the progress that are being done in there. And analog space mission are looking into developing this more. Um, for example, initiative would be to have different modules that you could have emetic seals between them, and you could decide if your mission would be one compartment, two compartment, three compartment, and then you'd have really those kind of locks uh, together, air locks basically, and that should be airtight. And you could, to simulate a bit the danger, you could change slightly the pressure between outside and inside, so astronauts would have to go through a few minutes of the compression or compression before coming in and out for EVAs. That would increase the simulation, uh, but it would also, again, reduce the amount of money available for other experiments. So it's still something that is in discussion and in progress. Uh, but it's a very exciting field, um, very tough one, uh, but also it's probably one that generates the most uh, return for Earth applications, both from a um, water management system, energy system, and just being conscious about what you actually need as a human being in terms of water, in terms of food, in terms of, 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 of just uh, life support needs in general. Okay, I'll see you next time.